Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship here this morning. We may have, uh, we're breaking in some new sound. Trying to work out some bugs, so if we have some inadvertent squeals and squeaks, you'll know that uh, we have, don't have all the bugs worked out just yet. So we've been kind of running around uh, with, with practice this morning so that we can uh, do this and uh, without any bugs, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes here. Well, hey, uh, it's, it's uh, Valentine's week this week, 14th, and we have fun with that, right? And so I just want to commend to all you guys out there, you know, when you leave church today, you might want to go over to CVS or down to Big Lots, pick up, pick up your card today, make sure you have it uh, stashed away so that you've got your Valentine. I was, I was thinking about Valentine's Day days past, and uh, when I was a kid in elementary school, do, do you remember getting those, uh, those big packets full of Valentines? And, and there was a, it was like a mixture. There were some big ones and some small ones, and, and you'd go to school and, and fill up the, the box. And uh, I remember very distinctly, uh, I think I was in second grade, and uh, I, of course, had my eye on the prettiest little girl in the class. And, and it would have been Kim, except she was still a baby then, so she didn't have a chance. It been, but it would have been her. And, and, uh, and, I, and I certainly picked out the biggest card, Valentine, for her. And, uh, and so when I got home to open all my Valentines, you know, I kind of expected, because I, I was feeling it, you know, if you will, for this, this, this little beauty. And so when I got back home and I opened up uh, my Valentines, I found that this uh, same girl who I was goo-goo for had, had sent me the, the absolute smallest Valentine. In fact, I know it had like a picture of a worm on it. It's a matter of fact, and and, uh, and I was I was shattered. I was broken because she obviously wasn't feeling the same thing that I was. And uh, but you know sometimes we we fall into the error of thinking that love is the same as feelings. We get confused when when we think that just having feelings is equative with love. And, and that's just not quite the case. You see, because, because love is always about the other person. Love is always about giving. Love is always about doing for. Uh, love is never about thinking about what can I get out of this deal. Love is always actionable toward the other. And so we don't want to confuse or misconstrue the definition of love. It's not feelings. It's always about the other. And even our worship even our worship is, is an act of love. We've gathered in this place today. Uh, we will receive, I have no doubt of that, but we've come to give. We've come to give love to our God, to sing His praises, to glorify His name, to, uh, to pray to Him, to bow down to Him, to give Him honor and glory, simply because He is the amazing God. What we do today in worship is an act of love. Not a bunch of feelings but a true act of love. So would you right now get your hearts ready for that? Would you bow your hearts and minds and prepare yourselves to love the living God? Let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your beautiful, amazing love that you pour forth on us moment by moment and day by day. Father, I ask that you come to us now with the full presence of your Spirit. Would you, would you rain down on us even now and allow us to respond to your love by expressing our love for you? Would you fill our hearts would you uh, move in our minds? Uh, would you allow us to, uh, to truly express love for you? I pray that you do that now through our prayers, through our music, through the word. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's welcome our children to come forward and let's sing over them as they learn to love our God.
Would you join me, please, in our liturgy for the children? People were bringing little children to Jesus, just like these ones, to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw that, he was indignant, and he said this to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and bless them. So would you now please, in a, as an act of love, would you raise your hands forward toward these little ones? And guys, would you put your hands out this way to receive prayer and blessing? Heavenly Father, your love is amazing and magnificent. It has no end. And we thank you for it. We thank you that your love formed these little ones in their mother's wombs. Father, we pray that you would show them your love, that you would teach them your ways, that you would counsel them with wisdom, and that you would let them know that you are and will always be their loving Father. Lord, would you come and do this now? We pray it in Jesus' name. And all his children said, Amen. Let's go worship. Would you stand with me now as our God calls us in this place to give him worship today from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us lift our voices, our hearts, and give praise to the one and the only God.
all God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. We are talking a lot today on the subject of love, and uh, this is our Father's world, and our Father loves us beyond compare. And if, if we chose not to shout out to Him that we love Him, even Scripture say, even the rocks would cry out. Even, even the mountains would stand up on, on tiptoe, as it were, and cry out and reach out to God and say, God, we love you for who you are. But we recognize that, that we're not always in that train of thought. We're not, not always in that mode of thinking. Our hearts are not always, are not always pure and on track. Oftentimes, we, uh, we fall into, uh, into places where we ought not go, into places of temptation, places where, uh, where we fall and stumble. But we have a Father who is always there because of His love waiting to pick us back up and brush us off and hug us, as it were, and make us new again. And so He calls us as a loving Father to His, his seat, His throne, that we can confess to Him, to, to make things right with Him, and to receive His, uh, his love. And so we do that even now as we Pray in confession together to our Father. Let's pray. Almighty God, you've called us to be the church and continue the mission of Jesus Christ to our lonely and confused world. Yet we acknowledge we are more apathetic than active, more isolated than involved, more callous than compassionate, more legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy on us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles preventing us from being your representatives to a broken world. Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your indwelling spirit. This we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. And let us go now in the quiet of our own hearts and lay down our burdens at the throne of God. Father, how good you are to us. How deep is your love for us. That uh, you would reach down, and even for, even for a sinner like me, you would call me back to be your own. And you would even hold one like me and give me new life and make even one like me new again. Father, I can't express the joy I can't express the gratitude. I can't express what to give back for your dramatic and radical expression of love to me, to us. But Father, would you hear our prayer today? Would you hear our proclamation today as we gather and say simply, thank you, and we love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name, we pray this. Amen. I'd like you to hear words that are necessary, words that are very good, words of assurance of pardon, that because our God loves us with unfathomable love, He doesn't leave us where we are, but He brings us back to Himself. And so God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is because of his work on the cross that you and I, formerly captives, have been set free. That you and I, who were soiled with sin, have been made like white as snow. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, 
This is the love of our God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and respond to that beautiful love. Thank you, Kaylee and Jordan and Amanda and Tyler for leading us today in music. We've got to get this microphone thing worked out, don't we? How are we, how are we doing back there, Ryan? Am I okay? Should I change the microphone, do you think? I'll try moving it down. Can I try that? Move it up. Try to move it up. Okay. Turn this off. Okay, let's give this a shot. Let's give this a shot. Let's see how it goes. Well, good morning, everyone. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, 
We started this morning with a little bit of love talk, a little bit about, about Valentine's Day and uh, uh, that sort of thing, and, and about how we can make an error when we uh, equate feelings, just feelings, with, with true love. There's nothing wrong with feelings, but uh, when we define love as being merely and only a stream of good feelings, then you see our pursuit of love becomes this endless chasing after good feelings. Just, just one good feeling after another in whatever form or flavor they, they might take shape. And this reducing down of what real love is to a, to a mere set of feelings, this uh, what I'll call false love, can easily move from, from just being an heir in definition by us to becoming a very real danger to us. Because our human tendency is to glorify the things we love, whatever they are, falsely or not. We glorify the things that we love. And if we invest our love falsely, we will glorify what is false. So in our text this morning, we're going to hear Jesus teach us, as he teaches his disciples, that if we love what is true, we will glorify what is true. And that true love always glorifies God. True love always glorifies God. And so would you turn with me today in your scriptures, to your Bibles, to your swords of strength, to John chapter 13. As we continue this series in the Gospel of John today from verses 31 to 38, true love glorifies God. Now we know that uh, Judas has just left the scene. Jesus has washed their feet. He has told them to do likewise to one another. And Judas has now gone off to do his betrayal. He's off into the night. And so when he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and let us pray. Father, your word is is truth. Your word is life, and you teach us truth and life and love by the power of your spirit and through your word. So would you come this morning and fill this place to overflowing with your spirit and open our minds and our ears and our hearts to your word, that we would learn from you what you would have us know. And would you forgive me, Father, for the mistakes that I will make today and remove all of them from our minds and memories, but Lord, everything that's good and true that lasts, that's in accord with your word, let those things take root deeply, deeply in our hearts that we would bear fruit for your kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, these first two verses today that we encounter, verses 31 and 32, are remarkable. We're going to take a look at them. And and they are strange. And they require our attention. They just do. We find the words of Jesus here remarkable in that he's speaking about his coming death. 
but he speaks of it not as a martyrdom, nor as a defeat, not like a, as a disgrace, but rather as his very glorification. That is his, his magnification, his, his praise, his, uh, his being honored and extolled. We, we see the word glorified, glorification mentioned five times in these first two verses. And it, and it seems very strange that in these circumstances, Jesus should say, now, now is the Son of Man glorified. You see, there had been other moments that we might view as having been more fitting or more appropriate for Jesus to have said these words. Maybe, maybe after His baptism, when the, when the cloud opened and the Father said, this is my Son on whom my favor rests. Maybe that would have been an opportune time. Maybe after the transfiguration, when, when His face shone like the sun and his, and his clothes were white like a light, and the Father said again, this is my Son on whom my favor rests. Listen to Him. We might expect that, that Jesus would say, my glorification was, was in those moments. But instead, He chose this coming moment of accusation and betrayal, of condemnation and abandonment, of suffering and agony to speak about His glorification. How remarkable and how strange, certainly from our perspective. But John, as he's always doing, is helping us to see things from God's perspective, from God's viewpoint, with with God's eyes, with his eyesight. And what God sees in the death of his son is the glorification of his son. Which from a human perspective, again, may seem remarkably strange. And yet we read this morning the words of Christ that his ultimate glorification is coming now, right now, in this moment with his very death, only a matter of hours away from this point in John 13. How how is it that his death is his ultimate glorification? How how is it? Well, it it was at the cross that he, Jesus, the Son of Man, performed the, the single greatest work in the history of the universe. The cross was reconciliation for the world. It was was restoration, the beginning of restoration to the fallen creation. It was what all of human history had waited for. And it's everything that human history has looked back upon since. That's why he's glorified. It was at the cross that, that Christ reversed the work of the first Adam. The first Adam who was was disobedient, seeking life on his own terms. And now the second Adam, obedient to the Father, even obedient to, to death, even. It was at the cross that Christ, the Son of Man, defeated the enemy who had the power over death and set free those of us who were captive in slavery to fear of death. It was at the cross that Christ, the Son of Man, made atonement for sin. He made at one minute possible with God the Father and us so that all the children, all the elect of God, are granted the promise of God, eternal life. Jesus, the Son of Man, is glorified. He's honored. He's given the name above all names. And there is no other name given by which we must be saved. It was at the cross, at the moment that is now coming in John 13 in our story, that Jesus, the Son of Man, accomplished what no one else possibly could. And He is glorified in it. That is how He's glorified at this moment. And even as He's glorified, as the Son of Man, as the the Word made flesh, so too is God the Father glorified in Him at the very same time. Just as His work on the cross was the basis for our salvation, the glorification for Him, it was also the greatest manifestation of the glory of God. Because every attribute of God was supremely magnified at the cross. Every attribute of God. It was at the cross that the power of God was fulfilled, was glorified. Having been tempted, tortured, betrayed by by man and by Satan, no one was able to take his life until he gave it up himself, willingly so. Such is the power of God 
demonstrated at the cross. It was at the cross that the justice of God was glorified. So that justice would be preserved, God made His own Son, who had no sin, to be sin for all, and did not spare Him. Our God, who is always just, who demands justice, carried out justice on the cross for our sake. It was at the cross that the holiness of God was glorified. Because holiness cannot cohabitate with evil, the Father turned His head away, His face away from His own Son on the cross. Because He'd become a curse for us. And it was in that agonizing moment that Christ looked up and said, Father, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's holiness was maintained without compromise at the cross. It was at the cross that the faithfulness of God was glorified. God made the promise of life for His children, and He made it known through Scripture that His Son would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. He'd be pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and it would be by His wounds that we would be healed, the faithful God keeping His promise. It was at the cross that the love of God was glorified. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would have eternal life. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He first loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice what kind of love is this but perfect, beautiful, magnificent love that God would do such a thing for a sinner like me and like you? And so it's at the cross, it's, it's the now in our story in John 13, that Jesus says now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in Him. The remarkable, amazing, beautiful, matchless perfection of the cross in which the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in Him. Amen? Those are those first two verses and they're, they're a bit naughty, gnarly when you read them, but when you pull them together, you understand exactly what he's saying. Hear the Word of God. It's from this point, talking about his glorification, that Jesus launches into what almost seems to be a totally different stream of thought in verse 34. In fact, there are many biblical scholars, guys a whole lot smarter than I am, who over the years have, have supported the idea that John has done some sort of a cut and paste job here with his, with his scripture. That, that somehow uh, these things, these verses that follow, they, they were from totally different parts of Jesus' life and ministry. That talking about glorification and then talking about a command to love, they don't fit together somehow. So they think that, that John did a cut and paste. But I don't think so. I think these verses fit together beautifully, remarkably, and perfectly. And I want, to, I want to tell you why I think that and why I think you should think that. In telling them to love one another, Jesus isn't giving them anything radically new, by the way. Because the law of Moses required love of God and love for one's neighbor. Jesus himself said, well, all the law and the prophets can be summed up in these two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So the commandment to love is nothing new. The newness of the command in verse 34 is because he's given it a new standard. He's raised the bar. And he's raised it dramatically, and he's raised it with love, true love. Jesus says, I'll only be with you a little bit longer, and this is what you must do once I leave. Love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's by this that all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another like I loved you. And this is what we know about the love that Jesus had for them. This is the, this is the standard, this is the bar that he raises. 
We know that Jesus in his love, he gave his love fully and freely and he held nothing back, not one ounce, not one iota. He gave everything. He gave his love without expectation of have any, having any of it returned to him. There was no, there was no sense of, of wanting a payback for it. It was given freely. It was grace. He gave his love knowing full well that those he loved would even turn their backs on him. Some would even betray him. And yet he never stopped loving them, not for a moment. He gave his love without qualifying those he gave it to. He loved the unlovable. He loved those who no one else would. There was no no test to pass. There were no qualifications. He simply did. His love was always rooted in the other person. Never about what he might get back in return. Completely selfless. Selfless. His love, you see, wasn't about his being filled up or wanting to be filled up with with good feelings. It wasn't, it wasn't about the, the fun of the ride, if you will. See, see, it couldn't have been about his feelings. It couldn't have been because his feelings were true and they were real. Because the feelings he had were the feelings of having his, his hands pierced and his feet nailed to a cross. His, what he felt was, was his back being scourged by what, what he felt was is having a, a, a crown of thorns gouged into his skull. What he felt was people spitting on him and and rejecting him, falsely accusing him. What he felt was the rejection of of those he even came to save. He came to this world, but his own did not receive him or understand him. He was rejected. He was feeling betrayed by his own friends, betrayed and sick in his spirit over it. His feelings were true and they were deep. He felt everything that we could ever feel and then some. But if his love were dependent upon what he received, how could he have any love? How could he be anything but bitter and angry and depressed if if it was about his feelings that led him to love? You see, it wasn't. He felt, but it wasn't because of what he received in feelings that allowed him to love or not to love. If Jesus reacted that way, he would have been indifferent to it all. But his love wasn't based on a collection of of feelings. His love was rooted in, based upon, fully demonstrated, get this, in glorifying God. You're going to have to sit on this one for a while today. His love was based upon his glorification of God. This is exactly why these sets of verses fit hand in glove. It's exactly why he talks about glorification first and then love after that because you show God, you show love by how you glorify God in your life. True love glorifies God. And that's what it means Jesus is telling us to be his disciples. Love one another as I have loved you in all these same ways. Don't look for a payback. Don't look for warm, fuzzy feelings. Because while those are fine, that's not what love is about. It's not. By this, the world will know that you belong to me. His love means investing in one another without expectation for a return. His love means remaining faithful even when you've been talked about, gossiped about, and excluded from. You still love. It means love does reaching out and welcoming, especially to those who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, who don't act like you. It means reaching out to everyone because they are made in the image of God. Loving means to live as if to glorify God. Glorifying God is true love. And there is no substitute, none at all. Jesus raises the bar on love. And as you leave this place today, I want you to know that true love is seen in the glorification of God in your lives, whether it be at home, at work, wherever. If you're glorifying God in your actions, in your speech, in your motivations, you are loving as Christ loved you. So go from this place today and love, and as you do, glorify God. Amen.
Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word that, that pierces, uh, that convicts, that, that pulls on us, that pushes us, uh, that challenges us. And I, I thank you for that because, Lord, I need, I need you to push into my heart and my head and my life. Lord, I, I need you. And I want to become more and more like my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, would you impress upon this church, this community, this congregation, the importance of opening your word and allowing it to, to come alive, to, uh, to jump off the, the pages and enter into our hearts, that we would feed upon it, drink upon it. It would become a part of, of who we are and what we do, that we would see life as, as an act of glorifying you. And in that, we would be loving in just the way that Jesus commands us to love. And Father, would you show us how to glorify your name in our lives? Father, we, we pray to you for everything. Today, we come to you with a, a, a sense of brokenness that just, just hurts We, uh, we pray for, uh, for the Landry family, for uh, Jim and Joanne, for uh, the loss of their son Jimmy, who battled hard and who uh, was taken yesterday to be home with you. Would we pray for Jimmy's wife, Andrea, for his sons, Brandon and Zach? Just praying that you would surround them with your care and love and even understanding in a moment that is not understandable. Lord, would you uh, just shower them in ways unexpected and unknown with love? Would you, would you prompt your congregation to spring forth in love and glorify your name as we, as we minister to the Landry's? Lord, I uh, pray for Stanley, my brother Stanley, as he mourns the loss of his sister, Kate. Lord, I, I never met her, but I understand she was a beautiful woman, and her loss is being felt greatly. Um, would you give to Stan and his daughter and his entire family a, a sense of peace in knowing that she is now standing in your presence? Lord, for all of our needs, uh, for our health needs, for our needs of relationship, for our needs of wholeness. Lord, would you just come and speak into those broken places and, and fill and bring life. Lord, we, we turn these things over to you and ask you to, to bless. And we pray, Father, we pray together. We pray the words that Jesus gave to us. They're, they're words of, of radical love. Words that speak of a, a future day here when things will not be as they are now, but how they are in heaven. We, we pray for that day to come and to come soon because we, we don't enjoy the sorrow. I know that it strengthens us, Lord, but we look for that new day. Would you come? Would you come now and bring us that new day? And we pray for it. We pray for it this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue our worship by the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, You have us, and You have us completely. Such is the depth of Your love for us. Not because of what we have done. Certainly not because of what we can return to You. But simply because You love and are glorified in Your love. Father, we thank You so for Your blessings. We ask You now to help us to see clearly, see rightly how to glorify Your name with these resources in this place. Would You show us how to, how to build, how to make relationships, how to bind hearts, how to be obedient to You, that we would give You glory in what You've given to us and that we might love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. A few announcements today. Uh, today is uh, Penny Sunday, by the way, and uh, today I'm reminded that uh, donations are going to the B.F. Jones Library in the Aliquippa, so please be generous to the ladies uh, in the back of the room as you leave today. We uh, will have a congregational meeting next uh, Sunday after church. The purpose of that meeting will be to receive our annual report for 2014, including our budget for 2015. You can, on your way out today, pick up copies of the financial report for this year and the budget for next year, so you can read them and review them for our discussion next Sunday. So please pick them up uh, on your way out. A reminder of the Polka Dinner Dance on Saturday the 28th. We be, we're going to begin that at 6. I think we'll ask you to show up at 5.30 as you bring your, uh, your food items. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, also, uh, Pizza with a Purpose is this Friday. We're going to have a discussion with uh, Herb Bailey from, from Uncommon Grounds talking about uh, what it means to, to be missional in the community of Aliquippa. So, so Herb is going to help us think more and more deeply about what it means to, to love like Christ in the place where he's called us to be. So please join us for that. That's Friday at 6, right? And Clara, and Clara has sign-up sheets for that in the back, right? And sign-ups for Polka Night as well in the back. So, Claire, raise your hand and everyone can see you. Great, great. Okay, and then uh, new members class. We begin our third week uh, in the fellowship hall immediately after worship. I'll see you in a few minutes back there, guys. Look forward to our, our session together. And uh, wondering if there's anything else for the cause today. Yes, Steve. Thanks. Ed, Eduardo. Uh, next Sunday, after At youth group tonight, Eduardo, yes? Yep. Youth group tonight, regular time, okay. Any, anyone else? Nancy, yeah. Oh, prayer, prayer vigil. Uh, we're having our prayer vigil for our Generations campaign. That's on Thursday this week. The sign-up sheet is right behind Arden's head in the Northex. Uh, there are half-hour slots. There are still plenty of slots available. Ask you to, to come, and we'll have uh, materials for you here to, to pray through as we pray for our church, our wholeness, and, uh, and our love. So would you come and, and pray with us on, on this Thursday? from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m. Pick your slot, okay? Anything else? Uh, if you, you've seen a familiar face here. We've got Jordan's back. Hi, Jordan. Thank you for coming out. And your friends Tyler and Amanda have joined us as well. So thank you guys so much for coming out today. Um, 
they, they had a performance at Grove City last night and were able to stay and uh, we're just excited to, to have them. So thanks so much. And, how, and could you give us a quickie, quick brief on uh, Tennessee, how things are going? Free Starbucks. Nothing? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're recording music, right? I just Thank you, Jordan. We're, and we're proud of you. We're praying for you, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Amen. Let's uh, let's stand and give praise to God.
is love, that you would love one another as I have loved you. And in this, you will show 